This video is about document format structure and layout. Do note that I have uh, already done a video on organizational features and a video on organizational features go through some formatting as well. So you may wish to have a look at that video for your own information. We're going to have a look at different types of documents. We're going to have a look at how to structure these documents, what type of content uh, they need to include, and this type of things. We're going to have a look at five main types of documents. Let's start with the first one, common one, a formal letter. Now, letters are used to communicate a message to customers, for example. Formal letters usually with customers. Like BT, Eon, Barclays, Sainsbury, and so on, they may post letters to you about their services, uh, about something else, and so on and so on. You could also write formal letters yourself. You could write formal letters to complain, for example, to complain about a product, a service, or whatever else. Now, it is less and less common to send letters. We usually now use emails instead of letters, but letters are still used, and you may be required to send a letter rather than an email. It could happen as well. So it's always a good thing to know how to write a letter. It could be something you will need to do in the future. Now, formal letters, I use the word formal. Formal like professional. So it's not a letter you send to a friend. A letter you send to a friend, you write it however you want because it is a friend. However, formal letter, there is a convention to follow. So when you send a formal letter, you include in your letter your address without your name. You don't need your name with your address on top of the letter because your name is at the bottom anyway. So just put your address. You put the address of the recipient, and the, the address of the recipient, the recipient is the person you send the uh, letter to, or the company you send the letter to. You put a date, you also put a salutation, what do I mean the salutation? It is like, dear sir, madam, uh, dear Miss Johnson, uh, and so on and so on. This is what we call a salutation. Now, you could uh, put a heading. What I mean by heading is like a reference. Uh, it is possible to, uh, to put a reference. It's usually uh, better to have a reference, a heading, to say what the letter is about. So, what is the purpose of the letter? And then your full message, and at the end of your message, you've got a valediction. A valediction is like yours faithfully. So you use yours faithfully if you start your letter with dear sir, or dear madam, or dear sir and madam. Uh, you end your letter with yours sincerely if you start with dear uh, Mr. Diwali, uh, dear Ms. Parridge, and so on and so on. So if you name the person, yours sincerely at the end. If you don't name the person, yours faithfully. This is a convention. There is no reason why you would be more sincere with the person that you name and be more faithful with the person that you don't name. It's just a convention. Name a person, yours sincerely. You don't name the person, yours faithfully. That's it. Now, Let's have a look at the layout of a letter. So, right. So, let's have a look at an example of a letter. So, this is an example of a letter. Now, your address here, let's say, like, for example, you work for a company called Crayons Limited. So, here we've got the name of the uh, company, Crayons Limited, with the address 43 Apple Yard, Leeds, LS350. This is all made up for your information. It's just fictional. However, I say company name, but if it is, you know, you writing a letter, not for a company, but for personal reason, then you would just put your address there without your name. In the same situation. So the address here, as you can see, is right aligned on top of the letter. However, it doesn't have to be right aligned. It could be on a single line. So it could be 43, comma, Apple Yard, comma, Leeds, comma, LF350U, centered on top of your letter on a single line 
rather than in a column there. You can see as well that I haven't used any uh, commas at the end of each line because you don't need it. It's a convention now not to use commas in your address when it is laid out as a column like that, right aligned. You could find some letters whose address, your own address is left aligned. Uh, it does happen, but it is more common to have your address right aligned. So just right align your address because it makes clearer what your address is and what the recipient address is. So we usually right align our address. Our address right aligned. So uh, the address of the recipient must be on the left, and that's important. Why is it important? It's because of envelopes. Nowadays, we use envelope with windows. And the envelopes with windows, the window, if you look at this example here, is on the left. So, when you write a letter, and then you fold your letter to actually put it in the envelope, the address on your letter needs to align with the position of the window on the left. That's why the recipient's address must be on the left to show through the window on the left. Do note that this is not an international convention. There are countries where the window is not on the left, but on the other side, on the right. Countries like France. The window in French envelopes is on the right. So if you were to work in France, then the recipient's address will be on the right because the window on the envelope is on the right and the recipient's address needs to align with the position of the window in the envelope on the right. But here, we live in England and in England, it is on the left. So the recipient's address needs to be on the left. Do not again that I haven't used any commas at the end of each line because they are not needed. And then below there, I put the date. Now, the date, there's no convention where the date should be. If it should be on the left, on the right, above the recipient's address, uh, below your address, there's no convention where the date should be. You need to put a date. Where you put the date depends on the company. The company will have their own convention with the date. But if you do it from home, Depends on where you want it to be. Personally, I use it here under the recipient's address, left aligned. Much easier that way. And then below the date, we've got the salutation. Here's dear Miss Willow. And below the salutation, we've got a heading, a regarding line, statutory surplus query. It's underlined to highlight that this is uh, the heading, uh, what the letter is going to be about. And then we've got uh, our message. Now, there's a certain convention to follow when we write a message because you don't just go straight to here is my problem when you write a letter of complaint. You have to introduce it. So when you write a letter, you start with an introduction. The introduction is your first paragraph that tells about what, why you are writing, the purpose of of the letter. You're writing that letter for a reason. So here my introduction, following your query regarding stationary supplies, please find and close with this letter catalog of our products. So straight away, here I introduce the purpose of that letter in that it is about following a query. But then once you have the introduction, you need to develop the message. So sometimes your letter will be longer uh, and other times will be shorter. Here is an example of a very short letter. But when you write a letter, it's got um, to have the right length. And what I mean by the right length, it is a length that will cover all points you need to cover. Because in the introduction, you say what you are writing about. So, contrary to this one, for example, if it is if it is a letter of complaint, then your first paragraph will be about telling what that letter is about. I am writing to you to complain about the product I purchase at your shop, whatever the name of the shop, on whatever the date is. And then you develop your point. So for each paragraph, you're going to write about what the problem is. So if you have more than one problem, then 
there will be a paragraph on the first problem, a paragraph on the second problem, a paragraph on the third problem. And then at the end, you have a conclusion. And the conclusion, the concluding paragraph, is a paragraph about, well, what do you want out of it? You're writing with a purpose to complain, but is it just for the information, I'm just complaining for the sake of complaining, or you want something out of it, like a refund, a replacement of the product, and so on and so on. So you need a concluding paragraph to actually close the whole message. And then you end with a valediction. If your salutation is a name, if you start with a name in your salutation, like dear Miss Willow, you end with your sincerely. But if it was uh, dear sir, dear madam, dear manager, uh, dear counselor, and so on and so on, then to be yours faithfully. And then don't forget to give your name at the bottom of the letter. And it is now common to put your title in brackets. Here, Jem Apple, in bracket Mercy's, so that the recipient knows how to address you, well, how to address the person who has written uh, the letter. Dear Mrs. Maple, for example. Because if you don't know the title, if you are a woman, it's a bit tricky uh, how to start the letter. Am I going to start with Dear Ms. Maple, or Dear Miss Maple, or Dear Mrs. Maple? Which title should I use? So it is common to put a title with your name so that uh, the recipient knows what title to use when they reply to your letter, if a reply is required. So this is the format, the layout, the structure of letters. Convention to follow when you write a letter. And that's true as well for exams. So if you do an exam in English, functional skills in English, for example, then you will be required to follow that convention. You do get marks when you follow the expected format layout structure. Now let's move on to our second type of document. And our second type of document is completely different. We're going to talk about formal report. So that's another uh, formal document, professional document, a report. But the layout and structure is completely different because the purpose of the report is completely different. But there is an expected format again. You would expect a title with your report, an appropriate title. And usually the title is a bit bigger than the rest of the text. So an appropriate title, what do I mean by an appropriate title? It's a title that says what the report is about. And then the report is divided into different sections. And these sections have subheadings. The subheadings gives a quick view of what the sections are about. Now, sometimes reports have number sections. So a number section is using numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. You see that in official documents, for example, government documents, or documents from the council, uh, sometimes they give their paragraphs a number. So each of their paragraphs have a number. So, section one, first paragraph is 1.1, second paragraph is 1.2, third paragraph is 1.4. And then you've got section two, first paragraph of first section two is 2.1, then the second one 2.2, then the third one 2.3, and so on and so on. So that does happen to number all your paragraphs for ease to refer back. So paragraph 3.3, for example, well, you know where to find paragraph 3.3, because it is clearly shown in your report with the numbered sections. You could use bullet points as well, especially when you list something, bullet points make the list very clear. You could use what we call progressive indentation. Progressive indentation is you got section number one here, and then your first paragraph would be 1.1, for example, but when 1.1 will be further indebted. And then if you have a, a subparagraph below 1.1, you could have 1.1.1. That 1.1.1 will be further indented. And so on and so on. So this is what you call a progressive indentation. This is an example of a report, customer satisfaction review. 
So I know that report is about customer satisfaction review. I've got an introduction here, because you do need an introduction for your report. The company's board of directors requested an investigation into the new product CN4525 following a series of complaints. And then I've got different sections with surveillance. I've got section one, surveying the method, one the method. I've got section two, surveying the customer makeup. I've got section three, which is surveying the results, and section four, which is surveying recommendations. And here I use number section and progressive notation. You can see like uh, section two here, the customer makeup. We've got 2.1, 2.2, 2 .2, 2 .3, and these are indented. All these sections here, all these paragraphs, are the development of what the report is going to be. So the introduction says what the purpose of the report is, and then you have to develop each point. So you have to investigate the situation, and then you report the situation in an organized way. And at the end of it, you have a conclusion. My conclusion here is recommendations. What I recommend. So this is the format, structure, and layout of the report. If you do the functional skills, English, qualification, you could be asked to write a report as well in your exam. And again, you will be expected to follow a certain format and structure. And you do get points for that. Our next type of document is articles, newspaper articles. Now, newspaper articles could work like newsletters as well. So if you have to write a newsletter for your company, you'll probably be using the same type of formatting and structure. If you're doing the functional skills English qualification, then you will be, you could be, not will be, you could be required to write a newspaper article as part of the task. Newspaper article, if you, uh, if you are used to reading articles, either on the web or on paper, you are probably familiar about how articles look like. You would expect an article, an appropriate title. Again, appropriate title, which is the main headline, bigger font size, centered. And that tells what the article is about. You would also need a strap line. Now, a strap line is uh, a sentence or two, could be two sentences, but very short, that gives more information about the articles. It's usually below the title. So you've got a title, and then below the title you've got a strap line, and the strap line gives more information about what the article is about. And then we've got what we call an attribution. An attribution is who has written the article. So by whoever. Now, depending on the newspaper, the attribution could be uh, on top, below the uh, strap line. You see that? Or uh, it could be right at the bottom of the article. Whichever position is fine as long as we've got the attribution. And the last thing is subheadings. The subheadings divide your articles into sections and make your article easier to read. So this is an article about uh, a coach park with development, as the title uh, mentions here. I've got the strap line, a little park will be built according to the council regeneration plan. And that's by Aeon Kim, the attribution, and then I've got my introductory paragraph. So again, like uh, letters, you need an introduction. And then after your introduction, you need to develop your points into paragraphs and sections. And at the end, you've got a conclusion. Now, what I mean by a conclusion? Uh, with articles, it could be a summary of what you have written, or you could open the debate by asking a question at the end. What do you think? Or give your comments, especially when the article is online. When the article is online, the publisher quite likes to have the customers post comments on the articles. So to get people posting comments on the articles, quite often the article ends with a question to invite the readers, the customers, to actually post a comment about what they wrote about in the article. Now again, if you are doing the functional skills English qualification, 
For your exam, you could be asked to write a newspaper article, but don't be afraid to use different uh, formatting as well. You are, you will be able in your exam to actually increase the font size, to center, to embolden. So do increase the font size of the title, do center the title, do the same with the strap line, do embolden your subheadings, because by emboldening your subheadings, it clearly marks off each section. Again, if you do the exam in functional skills in English, you do get points if you follow the convention or the expected format and structure. Our next type of document is emails. Now emails, I guess a lot of you already know about emails. A lot of you already use emails, send emails, receive emails. So you'll probably be fine with the structural layout, but you know, let me remind them to you just in case. We've got two different types of emails. Emails could be formal or informal. So if it is formal, then the type of language you use at the layout is a bit more professional compared to informal. Right, let's start with formal uh, emails. What do we expect in a formal email? Well, we know it is an email because there's a two field. So there's a from field, a to field, to field with uh, the email address of the person, of the recipient, I should say, the recipient email address. That's mandatory for both formal and informal, otherwise, no one will get the email. So we need a two field. The subject field, for formal emails, you need a, a subject. Don't send a formal email without a subject. That is impolite, shall I say. It's a bad manners. You do need a subject in your email. And the subject in your email needs to be precise. A subject like help, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, is not helpful. Subject help is to be avoided. A certain subject needs to be more precise. Support required with a technical issue on my computer. Something like that, for example. It's more precise and it is clear what the, the email will be about. So subject is mandatory for formal emails. An appropriate citation and as it is formal, you would start like a formal letter Dear sir or madam, or dear Miss Akwabe, if you know the person you're writing to, and so on. You then need to write your message, like a letter, an introduction, you develop your points, a conclusion, and then a valediction. Valediction is mandatory in formal uh, emails, like yours faithfully if you start with dear sir or madam, or yes sincerely if you start with you have Miss Aquave, a name. And then at the end, it is mandatory for you to add your name. Informal emails, a little bit different. Now with informal emails, because you send it to a friend, uh, then strictly speaking, subject could be optional, but really it's preferable. Having said that, if you do the functional skills English exam, we would expect a subject for informal emails as well. So do add a subject for informal emails as well. But in real life, it's up to you. Although it is preferable to have a subject. Informal emails, you need uh, an appropriate salutation. You start with uh, hi there, uh, for example, because it is you know, informal, so you can say hi, hello, it's fine. Although, if it is a friend, you know that person quite well, uh, if it is something you ask very quickly, then in real life, you don't always start with a salutation for informal emails. But again, if you do the exam for functional skills in English, we expect an appropriate salutation. So you don't need to give, to give a salutation for informal emails as well. You should see the exam. Validation at the end. So again, depends on the person, because it is informal, you may not have a validation at all, especially if it is uh, something, a one-line email, which happens between friends. Uh, but again, if you do the exam of functional skills in English, we expect a validation. And then your name at the end. So this is an example of an email. You can see, well, from here, from, uh, from Steph Littlejohn. 
Uh, I made it up. The email address is made up as well, so don't send an email to that person because it will get back to you. It's completely made up, including Marcel Demarais is made up as well. So these emails addresses are completely made up, but they're just there as illustration, just to explain to you the format of an email. So from Steph Little John to Marcel Demarais, email address, Marcel Desmarais at yahoo.com. And then the subject, birthday invitation. And then we've got salutation, hello Marcel. So I started with hello Marcel, or whether Steph started with hello Marcel, which means that it is an informal email. And then end the message with cheers for now, valediction, informal, and the name Steph. Because it is informal, you can just have Steph. That is fine. And again, if you do the Functional Skills English uh, exam, you are expected to follow that format, even with informal emails. You need to have the to, the subject, the salutation, your message, validation, add your name at the end. Our last type of document is leaflets. Leaflets or advertisement, they are similar. Having said that, you could be using leaflets for just giving information, rather than advertising for something, could be the case, but quite often we use leaflets to actually uh, promote something. So quite often leaflets works like advertisements. So what do we expect? The format for leaflets slash advertisement, well, we need a title to get, an appropriate title so that we know what the leaflet is about. You need subheadings, you need sections, paragraphs, and contact details. Usually, when you produce a leaflet or an advertisement, you want people to contact you. So you would add your contact details. Contact details could be phone number, but it could be email address. Now, leaflets in real life tend to be quite colorful. Why colorful? Because colors attract the attention of the reader. Because that's what you want. With leaflets, you want customers. To get customers, then you need to attract them. To attract them, then you need to use an attractive formatting. A leaflet that stands out, that will make people read it. Depending on your message, what you want to sell, service, a product, or whatever, quite often you'll be using images, you could be using big words, bold, um, underline, italics, that different types of formatting you can use to make your leaflet attractive. Now here, my example of the leaflet is very basic. It doesn't have any colors or images or anything like that. That's an example of a leaflet you can create for an exam, for example. So if you are doing the Functional Skills English qualification and you are required to write a leaflet as part of your task, then this type of things you can do because your exam system will not allow you to insert images. So because you won't be able to insert an image, then there will, there will not be an image in your leaflet. In real life, however, if you are writing a leaflet for your own purpose, maybe for a car boot, you want to sell something, then you usually add an image because an image is very attractive. It attracts the attention of the reader, especially a beautiful image of a product that people would want. That example is an example for an exam, the Functional Skills English exam. We've got a title, the Little Phone Booth Library. The subheadings are underlined so that it is clear where they are for them to stand out. I even use center and bold, a small library with three exclamation marks to attract the attention of the reader. I even use a box. Are you a book lover? Question mark in big letters. Well, this font size is bigger, it's in bold, and it attracts the eye so that people who are book lovers will be attracted by this leaflet. And at the bottom, contact details. So this is the type of layout to use for your exam. As I mentioned uh, before, if it is not for an exam, if it is just for your own personal use, creating a leaflet to sell your car, for example, then you could be using this type of format as well, but I would advise you to use more colors, insert an image of your car, this type of things.
So this concludes this video on the five different types of documents, i.e. formal letters, formal reports, emails, newspaper articles, and leaflets slash advertisement. You are expected to follow a certain format, a certain structure. Your text needs to look like what it's supposed to be. Your text needs to look like a newspaper article if you write a newspaper article, a formal letter if you write a formal letter, and so on and so on. It is very important to follow these conventions. I hope you have found this video useful. Thank you.